I'm being joined on the program by the group CEO of the Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited, Mr. Mele Kiari. Thank you so much indeed for Thank you very talking much to us on China's television. Do you get fuel in your car these days? Yes, we do. Uh, in Abuja today, there are not a single queue. Uh, you do see sporadic queues early in the morning and late in the evening. Otherwise, you know, there's no problem with queues in Abuja today. And this ties to what is happening across the country. We are seeing gradual easing everywhere in the country. Uh, we're not there yet, but we we'll have a line of sight around when this will ease. I mean, it's, it's so sad the kind of scenario Nigerians have been made to go through. In the past three to four months, under the weight of buying petrol from the fuel station. And I'll put some background to this. Uh, we see price variance from one point to another and even from one state to the other, uh, with prices reportedly at about 600, 600 naira per litre in some part of the country. Queues have not abated in some part of the country, despite promises from various authorities, including others from the DSS. Uh, there also seem to be no sanctions nor end in sight. You're saying that there is some easing. But if I may ask you, sir, what is actually going on? Who is responsible? Who can we hold responsible for this shortage that we have seen over the last months? Maybe shortage may not be the right word to describe the situation. We have a log huge logistic challenge. And this has been persisting in the last uh, four to five months, as you have rightly pointed out. But how did it start? I think it's important to know what happened. Uh, first, there was a glitch uh, in terms of uh, road failure uh, around certain accesses because of the flood that we have. nobody has control over flood. I'm sure you agree with that. Once the, that flood happened, you know, we are unable to evacuate product from one location to the other efficiently. And Mind you, that in this country today, our redundancy around three days at, uh, uh, as a result of the lo huge logistic challenges that we have in the country. Once you have a glitch of three days, you will have a challenge of resolving this minimum of three, three weeks. This is uh, very, very understandable. This is the reality that happens. So once you have that situation, a number of things come into play. Uh, what comes into play? Number one, arbitrage will come in. Now, people would like to take advantage of that situation. They will move product from where it is sold cheap to where it is sold expensive. While you're having the same volume, because it will make sense for, for business people, and that's greed also, by the way, uh, let me qualify it properly. You know, greed will push people to hold the product even in their tanks and in their locations so that they're able to sell it at maximum, maximum price. So once we had that glitch last year, it is a, it's a very cyclic thing. Uh, so that you continue to see interventions that you have to do. But as you're doing this also, there are changes that happen that uh, nobody saw it coming, it wasn't planned, it wasn't anticipated, and what change can? For instance, once product land into this country, you have to take them by small vessels, we call the STS vessels, the ship-to-ship -ship transfer vessels, to the depots, or some of the vessels are actually able to deliver right straight into some of the depots. Now, the cost of hiring those vessels shift from uh, about $21, you know, early January last year, to close to $80, Per, per day in some locations today in the, in the country. And our compensation template uh, under the pricing regime that we are running today did not anticipate, they didn't see that coming. So somebody has to pay for this. And so that adjustment must take place. And of course, you also have sec a secondary issue, which is the issue of managing the depots themselves and the trucks. For instance, every depot buys equipment and facilities, manages them from materials that they have to buy overseas. And those materials, you must fi find FX to buy them, foreign exchange to buy them. They also move, prices move without any reference to our local situation. So their costs rise while we are not able to adjust for the benefit that they will require from the pricing template for them to recover their total cost. Now, even when you take the product out of the depots, you have to put them on trucks. Those trucks run, run on, on diesel. Our current template is, uh, uh, is premised on uh, gasoline AGO price or diesel price of around 300 to 400 naira to the liter. Today, because of the shift on the market, a liter of AGO sales to close to 900 naira, between 800 and 900 naira. So this is not anticipated. Nobody saw it this coming. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to take this product free from Lagos say, to Maiduguri at the same price, and, and of course, also recover their costs. And of course, as a chain of issues follow this. As soon as you leave the depot, uh, a number of taxes and levies happen you know, of all manners, either until it gets to the final destination. So once people see this, they will do everything possible to recover their costs. 
uh, no matter what you do, uh, this, is, this is reality that, that is unfolding. But as you are also doing this, uh, something also happened in the global market, uh, which is uh, very, very uh, obvious to all, is that uh, there is a shift in the market, there is a shift in the economic capacity of some of countries around us. For instance, today, uh, you will find Nigeria fuel in nearly every West African country. The reason is very, very sim simple. First of all, some of these countries are unable to import petroleum products because they cannot afford the current FX regime. For instance, a cargo of gasoline used to cost around 18 to $25 million maximum. Now it's going close to $70, $75 million. Some of these countries can simply not raise the necessary letters of credit to make those procurement. And by the way, uh, whatever border controls that you have, the reality is that when you move product from our country to any of these countries around, you are seeing price oscillation between 400 to 800 that are across the border. And uh, there is so much you can do when you have over 2,700 of border, hundreds of border control points, and a number of uh, uh, necessities that you will see on the ground, uh, that, that is reality that you have, to, you have to deal with. It's impossible almost to stop across borders. So fortunately, yeah. the subsidized Nigerian products yeah. are getting into these it, it other, get, other West African it gets, countries. It gets, it gets but guess what? The, the feelers out there is that people are blaming the NNPC. How do you absorb? Can you absorb the NNPC of all of these problems? Yes, I don't think it's about absorbing any institution. Uh, I think it's a system, systemic issue. Uh, it's a major distribution issue and then also the challenge of a, of a value chain. For instance, uh, when the products come into this country, you have to move them into ship-to-ship uh, -ship vessels, uh, into the time, into the time, into the time last. You know, a number of uh, partners, institutions, are involved in that in that process. You know, there's no one single point where you say this institution is responsible for this because you have a chain of issues. You need the navy, you need the uh, inspectors, you need NMPC, you need the regulators. Everybody has to align until you take this product to its final panel destination. So when you come to cross-border uh, smuggling of petroleum products, you know, it, it's very obvious that so much is being done. I'm, I've engaged the, the custom service uh, substantially. They are doing so much work around it to make sure that we contain that, uh, that situation. But it's not really not about NMPC or any institution. It is an arbitrage environment. Once you create a huge arbitrage environment, you're going to have this challenge. It's not even about the people. It's, it's the incentive that is there. For instance, when you take a, a, a truck of fuel, in, in Lagos, and you take it to a regular filling station, in, say in Maiduguri, the farthest part of the location, uh, you'll, you'll, your net gain is 270, your margin is 270,000 naira. Just imagine, if you are able to take this same product across the border, you can have margin of up to 40 million naira, or 50 million naira. So it's very, very impossible for you to contain a situation where you have a uh, an arbitrate environment that is very simple to call. It's not really about I mean, that. how do we then contain it? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm quick to start thinking about the pains of Nigeria and how that will ease. But that arbitrate environment that you talk about, how do we contain it? It can no longer continue, can it? Yes, arbitrage is two things are responsible for arbitrage. First of all, as a country, and I, I, I really do see why this is coming from. And, and the reason why government will, will insist on a subsidy regime. We know the relationship between petroleum prices and commodity prices. Nonetheless, uh, it is the policy of government to sustain a, a subsidy em, em, environment. That means your prices here are cheaper than what you have across the border. Now, the second part of it is that even where you have uh, an environment where the, the prices are, have normalized, coming to, even to market, assuming the prices in Nigeria is the same thing with Nigeria, for the Benin, Cameroon, and so on, even if you do this, you know, you have a, a, a reality around you, which is that uh, these countries are currently physically challenged. They are not able to import this petroleum. But we keep data on around who, who imports what into what country. Now we know that they simply cannot do this. It would have been an, a, a market situation. It would have been an advantage to our country delivering product to this, this, this location. So the combination of these two will make it practically difficult for you to control uh, cross-border smoking. So I'm quick to look at solutions now before I get into the other technical details. Uh, because as far as every Nigerian is concerned, as soon as we said we're going to speak with you, um, what they are concerned about is when will this problem, uh, these uh, key, fair queues, because it transports into something else, uh, cost of transportation will jack up, and cost of commodities also will jack up. So, when do you think we can finally have a breath of fresh air when it comes to this issue of uh, scarcity of fuel or the queues that we're seeing across the country? Yes, uh, I, think, I think it's good to also address why do you have the queues. 
uh, to begin with. I think it's very important to answer that question before you jump to when will it end. First of all, once you have a glitch, you know, there's a mindset that will come with it, very, very natural anywhere in the world, that when people see some semblance of scarcity, and what they see a queue of 10 cars in a filling station, for instance, you know, the natural thing anyone will do is that if your tank is at half, capacity, uh, half full, you say, oh, let me just peel off. And then when you enter the fuel station, you know, in the past, you know, it is very possible for people to say, uh, let me just buy 10,000 naira worth of oil or 5,000 naira worth of oil. But once you see a situation where uh, you may not have the next time you come back, uh, the, the chances are that people will fill up that. And so ultimately, people will stay longer in the fuel station even though you have fuel that, uh, that is available for, for, for dispensing. And this is very, very natural and understandable. What we're doing under this circumstance is to, to make sure more fuel than normal is available so that everyone that comes in to fill his tanks is able to fill his tank and leave so that over a period of time, those requirements will ease out and so that those people will not jump into the fuel. So the real reason really is not about even uh, scarcity. They are falling, uh, for instance, today, uh, year to date, our average evacuation from the deposit is up to 63 million liters a day. So there is no paucity of delivery into the fuel station. There is no uh, way you can actually explain that there's a lack of fuel in the country, but it's in the wrong location. In, in most most of the times, and certainly not just in wrong location, people have reacted very, very. What, which of these locations are the wrong locations you're referring to? Yes, the, what I mean by wrong location is that once you have a situation of uh, arbitrage, you know, uh, oil marketing companies and uh, oil traders will naturally find where is the highest pr price that I can get. So they will move those products to those those locations, and those locations can be the full station. They can be in trucks. You know, it makes sense now for, for business to say, okay, let me keep it where, wherever I can find somebody who is going to buy a 350, I'll sell it to him. Uh, so cumulatively, you have so much volume in your hands, but it's not getting to the right, right, right location. And secondly, uh, because of this uh, station that uh, has uh, uh, come on the, on the table, when people go into fuel station, they will naturally fill their tanks. And, and filling that tanks means that you spend more time in the fuel station. Mind you also, uh, there's another secondary issue that you have to, you have to deal with. When people come in, uh, today now our country is making progress through the electronic platform for payment. Sometimes these platforms don't work efficiently as you want. So instead of spending five minutes making the payment, you probably do 10 minutes. And where there's any glitch on technology, uh, people will insist that, look, I will leave this place until you, you, you feel my time. So a combination of issues hmm. that actually brought up this situation. I mean, for those who see conspiracy here, are they wrong? Conspiracy, how would anyone do this? I think, I think, I mean, the, I, I think this is the, It's a widespread feeling across the country that there is a conspiracy against the Nigerian people to, suffer, to make them suffer. Maybe let me state it differently. Uh, first of all, uh, I think there's hardship caused by this situation. No doubt about it. Uh, people spending more time in fuel stations than they would have ordinarily done. Uh, people paying more for what they could have paid less. And not only that, you know, losing man hours and so many other complications and pains. So, so we apologize to Nigerians for this. Uh, we're sincerely sorry that this, this happened. But, but simply, it cannot be a matter of conspiracy. It is impossible. When the floods came, you know, the floods don't respect anyone. They don't respect any situation. Remember that uh, for about 10 days, there is not a single vehicle that crossed Lokoja into Abuja, for instance, by implication, crossing into most part of northern part of this, this, this country. And very recently, I'm sure you are very familiar with this, you know, very recently, we have seen a situation where, uh, because of a, an accident of two trucks around Age in Niger State, you know, trucks could not leave that location for three to four days. You have hundreds of trucks lined up in that location, but they cannot move. So once you have that glitch, you know, it, it sends a number of other collateral uh, uh, consequences. They come up natural. It's very natural. So once you are not able to deliver to one city, people will see there's constraint, even though you have the product in the trucks, and then they'll start queuing up. And, and that queuing up is, uh, can only be freed when you have excess supply coming into those, those locations. And those locations are depreciated. You can have probably in one location. You may not have in another place. But I'm not sure anyone. It's not possible. It's not practical. We had a real problem that we are going through cycles to resolve. We have issues of the market that no one saw coming. And not only, not only that, you see, uh, when you have a logistic nightmare, you have a logistic nightmare. For instance, let me tell you, in this country today, every day, we load 1,800 trucks, 1,700, 1,000 trucks every day to move on our roads. Today, we have over 35 to 38,000 trucks running our roads, trying to deliver product to location anytime you have a glitch. And many things can cause this. Road problems, flood, 
union issues, and so many things that no one will sit down to organize and say, look, let's have float so that we can create this situation. I'm not sure anyone uh, will be fair to say that uh, uh, it is because uh, of some other consideration other than the practical reality that we're dealing with. Because there are those who hold the view that there are some people who are benefiting from the challenges that Niger the suffering that Nigerians are facing. Uh, and I like, it, it takes me to the question. About 6.4, 64.4 million is about the, uh, the average um, uh, volume that we, we have. But since I'm speaking with you now, uh, there's this disparity. Uh, customs have said uh, at some point that no, that Nigeria is not consuming as much as the volume NNPC says we are consuming. And those who will think that if Nigeria has so much of that volume, we shouldn't be experiencing this kind of glitch. Can you give us the figure? What is the consumption per day that Nigerians are consuming on petrol? I don't know if you have uh, bothered to look at our website uh, two days ago. We published the total volume of petroleum product dispatched from the depots, evacuation from the depots, in the last one week. And it's very, very clear that what we have done, average from January 1st, from the beginning of the year to today, we have done average of 63 million liters of evacuation from the mind, evacuation from the devil. Let me be very, very precise. Every day. Every day, average, since January 1st. Now, the meaning of that is that we know every truck that has left every depot in this country. We have numbers, truck numbers, destination fuel stations, destination states. And we have also published this by list of states. Where those trucks go, the number of trucks that have left those uh, those trucks. Now, when they leave the depot, you know, so where would they end up with? That's the question. And, and that is what would have translated into national con consumption. Today, I've made it very clear that uh, it is practically impossible under an arbitrary environment and also under a situation where your neighbors are helpless for you to say that there will be no cross-border movement of petroleum. That's why we're making it legitimate uh, in the sense that NMP is now buying fuel stations across our borders so that we can deliver to them legitimately. It's very simply impossible to stop this until you're able to uh, resolve this arbitrage issue. So, so definitely, uh, what you're dealing with is a, is a logistic challenge rather than anything else. So now, coming back to your question, when would that ease come? I think it's a very, very valid, valid question. For instance, you know, once you're able to put up more product into the market, uh, deliver more than what the country needs, uh, which is essentially what you have to do so that you can achieve that optimum level, uh, so that ultimately people will go to the fuel station, fill their tanks, and they will have no need for coming back until after a week or so, and then that way you can achieve uh, stability. And we have tested this. It works. For instance, in Abuja here, uh, under normal circumstances, you know, what we call dispatches into Abuja is around 120 trucks to 130 trucks maximum. Now we have done consistently over 150 trucks in the last one week. And the end result is that you are seeing the queues have gone. So we know that the solution is excess supply. So once you're able to do excess supply across the country, across location, you are going to resolve this, uh, this issue. When are you likely to have that? Exactly what we are doing now. We are ramping up uh, evacuation today in many depots. Uh, on daily basis today, now we are doing more than 70 million liters into the market against the regular evacuation level of up to 60, uh, 63 to 64 million liters. So uh, this will work. And we believe that the ease that we are seeing in many locations today, and I don't want to cite specific location, but I know that we are seeing ease across the country. Uh, this is easing up. I believe very strongly that within the next one week, I'm not saying that you are going to have zero queues in the next one week, no. Uh, I can't guarantee that because a number of things are out of our control. And of course, the market forces will, will determine some of these issues. But, but I believe that we, have, we are going to see substantial and relative ease compared to today in the next one week. That sounds like a good news. I mean, for a lot of Nigerians, and that should calm some nerves because people, uh, and what this happens, I mean, what happens is that when there are queues, it causes traffic. People panic, and there are a lot of things happen. Uh, there are all those, I mean, those who also have the of, of opinion that um, why deliver to tank farms who do not have sufficient filling stations? They are not as close to, the, um, uh, to those who are buying on the road. Uh, why not dispense straight to those who have fill, uh, filling station? Why are you not considering that? Yes, uh, you, have, you know, you have two categories of uh, uh, marketers. In our, in our terrain, mm -hmm. you have marketers who are integrated end to end. That means they have their vessels, they have their fuel stations, they have their depots. And then you have marketers who don't have this. Now, when you pull all the marketers that have integrated uh, capability, 
uh, even if they don't have the vessels to begin with, you know, they cover only 60% or about 50 to 60% of the total national fuel station spread in the country. So when you say you are left with this, you can't do it. But then you have another set of marketers who don't own depots. They are called the independent marketers. They constitute a very, very huge fragment of the marketing framework that we have in this, in this country. So you must have facilities that will deliver product to them. And that's why you cannot avoid having depots that are delivering to those who don't own these depots, but these depot owners don't necessarily need to own a fuel station. And why do we even have these depots in, to, be, to begin with? It's a pipeline problem. Because in our country today, the way we are organized in terms of the five line network is in such a way that no city, no location will be further than 500, 400 kilometers from the nearest depot. That means that you do not have, need this large number of trucks that we are seeing in the country. You also bringing product close to, it, to its users. But we, our pipelines are not functioning. And why are they not functioning? For instance, they have integrity issues, no doubt about it. But more than this, for instance, let me put it in perspective. Uh, you recall what happened in Jesse around 1998, where a number of people died, unfortunately. But the real reason was that they were trying to scoop fuel from our pipeline. And there was so much vandal action on those pipelines that since that day till now, we are not able to pass petroleum product to that line. And that means that you are not able to pass product from uh, Wari into Bini into Ore. That means Ore Depot becomes uh, unaccessible from, from, from that, that, that period. Now, taking another dimension. Uh, we have a depot called the Atlas Cove Depot. It's a reception depot. Between Atlas Cove Depot to Ilorin, you have the Mosimi Depot, Satellite, uh, the Ibadan, then all the way into, uh, into, into, Ilo into Ilorin. Now, this line, we are forced to shut it down. The reason is very simple. There are vandal actions to the extent that we are losing up to 24% of the total product that we pass into this line. When you pass 10 million liters and you lose 24%, that's 2.4 million liters daily from that line. Remember that 1 million liters gives you about 46 trucks. That means you are losing over 100 and 120 trucks to thieves and vandals of any sort. Some of them putting into budgets, which Nigeria Navy has helped us to eliminate them. Some are dragging into fuel stations and, and so on and so forth. Connections of uncountable proportion. And taking another access, so that we don't just, it's not a local problem, it's across the country. For instance, when you pump product in, 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 from Potaku Refinery Depot into Aba, you lose about 4 to 5% of that product. That is huge because technically you shouldn't lose more than 0.5% of the product. But we are losing 5%. Now, once you take it to Aba and you pump it to Enugu, that's the time we pump 10 million liters, we could only recover about two. That, and without a spill, not a single spill. So, so what would you do? So do you continue to use this pipeline? No. Are there integrity issues? Absolutely, yes. And this is happening across all our assets across the country. So what did we do uh, to, to curtail this? First of all, there must be a different framework. The pipeline must have access to technology, a different way of managing it, burying them deeper. We call it HDD. You must, must get third parties to put their money into it. And that's why we're going through a BOT process where private sector will come in, re, re, lay these lines once again all over, repump some of these depots so that we can now restore a supply through the pilot. Until you do this, you, are, you cannot eliminate the use of fuel depots. And, and those depots are naturally, not every marketer has a choice. In case I'm doing a depot to, to take to, to sell to others, I'm not ready to take, do fuel station. So when you say let us sequester all the products to fuel depot owners who are fuel, it is impossible to cover the whole country. Therefore, you will have no option than to make sure that you have a, uh, depots that... Uh, so, but, but we, the, the pipeline still looks to me uh, like what we see in other climes as uh, a, a reasonable means of transporting the product. But what is a permanent solution? We must be thinking about that. It's not that. just reasonable. Pipeline is the cheapest way of transporting petroleum so, but in any form of liquid. There are maintenance issues, there are integrity issues on these pipelines. What are you doing to ensure that going forward we have a solution, a permanent fix? No, uh, maybe, vandalism? maybe differently, what are we doing now? I think this is a better way of uh, putting this question. So I'm returning what is being done now? So, so, what's, what's, so what is being done now? <laughs> what's being done now is that uh, we have put in place a build, operate, and transfer mechanism. We have selected contractors who will put their money, billions of naira, to make replacement on those pipelines, to put their money so that these depots become functional once again, and not only that, so that they can recover their costs from the tariff that will come from this pipeline. It will make business sense. That's what we're doing now. Hmm. You have been also blamed, the NNPC that is, of uh, lack of forecasting, and that if you had forecasted uh, properly, 
maybe we wouldn't have found ourselves. You've given a lot of explanation about how we found ourselves here. Have you learned some lessons about uh, looking for, looking ahead and projecting properly? Should we have any kind of uh, exigency or emergency like we had in the flooding issue, which is one of the situations that you said came up as an emergency? Yes, uh, let me also still come back to the pipeline. You know, when the pipelines were active, those depots are designed to be, called, to be holding national strategic reserve. That means that at any one time, the interland depots have capability to hold up to 30 days of national supply. That means that, uh, you, first of all, you're not going to have problem or long distance travel. So it minimizes the risks of uh, issues around uh, access to road, uh, stability of our roads, and also natural phenomena like flood and, and other weather issues. Once the pipelines are not available, you are left with nothing other than manage the trucks. And those trucks' uh, reliability or redundancy is just three days. That's the point I'm try trying to make now. So there is no amount of forecast that you will make that will tell you there will be flood. So that doesn't exist. So once you have a glitch of three days, you will have to recover from it. There's no other way of doing it today now, other than restoring the, the pipeline. That pipeline is designed in such a way that we can move product. Now, how do you build 30 days of stock in the hinterland using trucks. It's practically impossible. That means that you have to move, uh, 30 days supply means about 60 million liters times 30. To be moved on trucks while you, you continue to supply to the fuel stations, it's not a real lack of uh, uh, forecast. We know the challenges. Uh, we, we always prepare for these three days uh, a glitch, and the ultimate solution is to restore the pipeline. How do you explain the, the price differentiation that we're seeing? Uh, is this some kind of racketeering, and who are those behind it? First, uh, I must also uh, add that uh, we had a very, very fruitful engagement with our partners, the oil marketing companies, the government security agencies, and also the other the regulatory institutions that are responsible for some of the activities, including the other all spheres of the government security agency. We have an understanding. First, uh, there are issues that uh, market must adjust to, which is the delivery issues from the from the ship into, into the depot. And also the realities around uh, the cost of moving product from depots into fuel station. That in reality, uh, we have an understanding. There is an element of which government has taken care of, which is government has subsidized the landing cost of this petroleum product into the, into the country. So that's kept, kept firm. LMPC delivers irrespective of marketer at the same price to every marketer at our, our, marine, our marine location. So what changes? is the cost of distribution, which, have, as I mentioned earlier, the, the template, the current template, already did not anticipate some of these drastic changes that happen in the market in terms of foreign exchange, in terms of the market change of the cost of uh, freight or vessels, and so on and so forth, and other taxes and levies that we have never seen uh, or imagined that they will happen. So that adjustment that we have done with the, with the marketers to recognize those realities has brought at par every sale at every depot. There's an understanding that no depot will sell around above the, the prices that we have had an understanding with them. That means it has normalized ex depot price. Once you normalize double price, the rest of the costs are taken by the market. It's being borne by the market, and that, that means that at every location today, nowhere in this country should sell petroleum product above 200 naira per liter. For instance, uh, this is what you saw. Anyone that does above this is in the grid territory. And grid, you cannot control grid. So the only thing you can do by grid is uh, legislation, uh, punitive actions, uh, leg uh, police, uh, all kinds of things that you can do to contain people's, people's grid. Now, what will check that is the very fact that when they have their sufficient product uh, beyond the ordinary need, mm -hmm. which is what would be sufficient now, something that is out of the normal, that grid will fill those vacuum, which is created by their grid, so that ultimately those grid will, will go away. But what you can also do, you can take punitive action. But does it always uh, serve the purpose of the challenge that we're facing today? The answer is probably uh, not, not, not so in, in the immediate sense, but certainly you know, some punitive action needs to be taken. There is another naughty issue, which is the issue of the subsidy. As the only importer of the fuel into the country, how do you calculate, how do you tabulate the issue of subsidy? It is very simple. First of all, we transfer product to oil marketing companies at 130 naira per litre so that we can establish a, a transfer price, uh, that's a market price of 170. That was one year ago. So that's the basis of all the est est estimates. Now, there are some adjustments that has brought us to, to the reality of the cost of uh, vessel that I've mentioned over and over. 
and, and that, has not, that adjustment took us to a different level in terms of the logistics. But what is firm, what NFC has kept hold is the transfer price from our marine, from our import, we call it the landing location, into, uh, into the marketing company. So today now, uh, if you just check, this is not rocket science. Anyone can find this out today. Uh, yesterday's data is that you, this product will land in this country at 295 naira to the, to the liter. That means you have to sell it at 113 to the marketing companies so that they will be able to maintain the current subsidy regime that we are, we are, we are running. It means you have about 185 naira per liter of subsidy on every product that comes into this country. Now, if you look at the average that we have done of 63 million liters January to date, and you con convert it to 365 years, that means you need 4.27 trillion naira for you to uh, meet the subsidy requirement for this country. This is really what you are dealing with. That's what subsidy means. At what point are you paying the subsidy? Today, we are the only importer of petroleum product. We have nowhere by, by law. Uh, there's a provision for uh, 3.36 3 trillion naira for, for January to June ending subsidy regime for the country. That means technically, uh, the Ministry of Finance is supposed to be giving us checks against this, uh, uh, this uh, subsidy, subsidy value on a monthly basis. But it's not a real situation in the sense that uh, uh, we are, we are a com company owned by, by the state today. We have fiscal obligations because whatever you do, and ultimately, uh, whatever money LNPC makes is from the fiscal obligation, taxes, royalties, and margin. All three, as today is, because we have not diluted the ownership of this company, all three belong to the state today. So the only way LNPC can do this is to hold back the fiscal obligation so that we can use that to, to buy the product and come and sell it to the market. This is really what we're doing. We mm -hmm. don't do any cash transfer. Well, the daughter vessel, is the daughter vessel uh, are they considered, factored in in, in, the, uh, in the subsidy regime? At this point, no. Yeah. So it's at, uh, at the market at the, That's at the point you pay the subsidy. No. It's, uh, what, what, what it means, was, let me maybe different it uh, in a different manner. Uh, different way of putting it is that when you bring product, you go to the market, you buy, you put it on a vessel and bring it to the country. So the cost that is going to uh, translate to is you are selling at 200 and you are bringing it into the country. We call it the landing cost at mm -hmm. 295 naira yeah. to, the, to the liter. But you don't want to sell it at 295 to the customers. That's to the major marketers and all other marketers, NMPC and so on. So you have to sell it to them at 113 naira for you to establish price in the range of 165 to 175 naira. That's the meaning of the subsidy regime. So that difference between the market price and the cost of landing is what, is what we are now attributing to the subsidy, subsidy regime, which is what I said today. In every liter you buy today, anyone that buys, uh, government is subsidizing you at 185 naira to each liter that you buy. Let's talk about the refineries. Yes. What is the state of things? Maybe the better way of doing this is that next week I'm inviting you so that me and you will go <laughs> to the refinery so that you will see the work that is going on. Today, uh, we are very comfortable with the rehabilitation work that is going on in Potaco Refinery. We have promised that we'll do first fuel uh, before the first half of this year, and his, his line of sight is clear that we can deliver on this. War refinery rehabilitation is ongoing. We are trying to align that uh, timeline to ensure that first fuel doesn't mean completing the rehabilitation exercise because this refinery rehab project is a stage by stage, first by stage. So you can have fuel as you continue to do your rehabilitation work. We think we can do this, but for Kaduna, I can't promise this. Uh, we just sign off the the contract for the rehabilitation of Kaduna refinery to take quite longer uh, period of time, and I don't think we can establish this before the half year, end of this year. Would it be your considered opinion that we we'll sell of these assets once and for all? Selling the asset, you see, when you sell your asset, uh, uh, it will be the decision of share. First of all, let me, let's get it very, very clear. I think there's a, it's a legal issue also. The law is very, very clear today that uh, this company owns this asset. It has been transferred to the NMPC Limited as its own asset. There is also a provision within the law for NMPC's interest or equity to be diluted so that Nigerians and others can buy equity in this company, which is the work we are doing to make sure that this company is IPO ready so that when the shareholders decide to, uh, to dilute their equity, they will be able to do this. The law provides that the National Economic Council, which is a body of all governors and the vice president, to sit down and agree on the value and the quantum of that uh, dilution that can be that, that, that can be done. Now, that's one way of taking your hands off investment in, in certain aspects of it. Also, because you are a limited liability company, you can decide that, look, I don't want to keep this anymore. I would like to sell this. It is selling an asset. You must have an asset that people will buy. 
that that means that you have to uh, prompt it up in a manner that people will will, will like to look by it. Mm. It's an option for the limited liability company to say, look, at the end of this, I've finished the rehabilitation. This is working now. Come and pick this. Uh, other than the process of uh, selling equity. So I look at it at, in this manner. Dan Gote is coming on stream. That's a threat to the Ford refineries. And so uh, those who are of the school of thought that as soon as this happens, the, the appetite to fix the refineries becomes very, very low. And so those who think also that maybe we should put this for sale to get a maximum, instead of the co uh, country spending a lot of money on turnaround maintenance and all of that, and we're not getting maximum benefit from them. No, I think Dan Gosier Refine is a compliment what we're doing. I know it's not a competition. By the way, uh, I don't know if you're aware, that we own 20% of the Dangote refinery. So we're part of it. So we see, we saw the value. We know that this is going to be of great value to our country and to our company. So having, having said this, you know, uh, today, uh, we are a net importer of petroleum product. Even when the Dangote refinery comes up, and that plant has capacity to produce about 52 million liters. Even if you keep all the products in this country, you still have a deficit. Looking at our current uh, uh, level of consumption in the country. So you have a deficit in the market. And by the way, you also have deficit around you. Uh, in most of West African countries around us, most of them are importing fuel from, from Rotterdam and so many other uh, further places, even from, the, from India. You may be surprised. So what this will do is that it will create a capacity for our country to first of all to be self-sufficient. It will complement our ability. Remember that even when we are able to complete the rehabilitation of our refinery, it, could only, it can only do 80 million liters of gasoline. Mm -hmm. That means that uh, you do need the WTO refinery for you to meet your domestic uh, re requirements. So the combination of this is that you will do, meet local refining, uh, you need local consumption needs. And, and not only that, you know, you'll be able to become net exporter of petroleum. It's not a liability at all. Nothing will stop. By the way, uh, the rehabilitation product is bound by a very firm contract, including a non-performance bond in the contract. So it's not going to stop. Uh, nothing will stop this rehabilitation work from going on. We are borrowing money to, to fix it. The borrowers will make sure that you complete it, otherwise you will not be able to pay their money. The, some of the payments are tied to your ability to make these refineries work. Part of the conditionalities is that they are not even going to allow us to operate this refinery, that we must put in place an, an, an operation and maintenance contract to make sure that it's out of our hands. So we understand this, uh, these are all preparatory to an IPO situation. And ultimately, when you plug this uh, refinery, for say, anyone will buy it. So sometimes this year, we should see one, of, one or two of those refineries come alive. That's the point I made. Um, let's gradually uh, come home now. And the NNPC, since uh, it turned, uh, transforming into a camera company, and all of those uh, elaborate events that we saw announcing the, the new NNPC in July last year, um, there are those who think that nothing really has changed. But Mr. Carey, what has changed? I think what do you expect to change? I think this is a different question that I can put. People should ex expect that. What do you expect from a company? Company must declare profit. Company must declare dividend to its shareholders. So how do you measure this? Your book of accounts. And our book of accounts are public now. Uh, we're not ashamed when we said that in 2018, we lost 803 billion naira. Today, by the changes that has happened since 2018 till date, we have seen gradual shift in the position of that company because we are, we are much more cost, cost conscious, we are much more efficient, we are much more modern company, we have better governance structure, we are much more transparent to our shareholders. And ultimately, what happened? This company was able to make profit for the first time in its history of $297 billion. And the following year, which is 2021, we also made uh, another profit of over $600 billion. So this is how you measure a company that is performing. And, and, and I'm sure that despite all the challenges of 2022, 2022 is also going to be a very great year for the company. That means this company, uh, what, is, what matters to a company is its ability not to operate at loss, to deliver value to its shareholders, to be able to declare profit, and shareholders will determine what they want to do with their, with, with their profit. So if you look at that perspective, you know, this company has done great. Today, uh, and I'm sure you, if you check this, and I invite you at any time to come and take a look at it, uh, we have one of the most a efficient process and system that you can find in any company country. You can ask our partners. They know this. Today, uh, the, the CEO of NMPC does not see any paper document today. You know, three years ago, that's not possible. Today, now, by sheer governance process that we are put in place, by automation that we are put in place, mm -hmm. by changes to, to, uh, to our own practices over uh, what we have always known, 
And because it is the only requirement of good governance, best practice, that this has changed because we are now a commercial company. There are things we can't do anymore. There are a number of interventions that NMPC has always done. We can't do them anymore. There are costs that sometimes we bear. We can't do them anymore. And ultimately, the end result is that this company is bringing value. We understand the glitch that is caused by false, false, uh, the false situation today. Absolutely understandable. It has beclouded everything else. But we understand also that this company has changed and it has transformed. It's a very do different company. Do have and, and there's a way of testing also this. You know, When you go to borrow, you know, relating institutions look for certainties, governance, transparency, accountability. Do you have the right system and processes? And, and that has been tested in the last one year since our incorporation. And today, we closed lending deals within three months. I'm sure that you may be aware that three years ago or four years ago, you probably need two years to close uh, lending deals. Uh, and this is also an indication because the market knows this. If you test the market, they will tell you that it's a very, very different company. That's what we can lend to this company. You must have a profit projection for, for the year end that you're looking at. What would that be? I don't want to speculate. <laughs> yes. But you should have had something. I know we make a profit. But if you did the last time of over, over 600 billion, mm. and that's a progression from over 200 billion. Let, let me put it differently. It's a, this is not a, six, a, it's a 600 billion profit company. If you look at the assets that are in our, in our kitty, uh, today we have over $60 billion worth of assets with the company. And we, are, we know companies that have far less assets in, in their hands, far less opportunities in their hands, declaring profits in the range of $5 to $10 billion. So it's nowhere near our ambition. It's nowhere near our capability. It is nowhere near our possibilities. And therefore, what we see, this is a multi-trillion naira profit company. And we are heading to this. It is very practical, it's very, very realizable. Would it happen this year? I do not have the numbers to back it up. But I know that by law, this company must be fully ready for IPO in three years after first uh, incorporation. And I believe very strongly that we will be one of the Fortune 100 companies by the three years. And this is very practical. All right. Um, just to wrap up, <sighs> things have gotten bad in terms of uh, oil theft. In August of last year, the nation's crude oil production hit a low and abysmal levels of less than a million barrel for a crude sufficient giant like Nigeria and a strategic member of OPEC. The levels even fell far lower than the OPEC quota for Nigeria, leading to loss of revenue and several production cuts and threats by oil companies to divest uh, their interest in Nigeria. And all these have been attributes to oil theft. How did things go that bad? Let me start from the, the better part of it. For the days that countries, companies, nations can rise to challenges. And we rose to this challenge. And today, from the low numbers that you have counted, we have gone below a, billion, a million barrels per day. Today, we are doing 1.6 million barrels per day. That means recovery in the excess of 600 million barrels per day. This didn't come from the blues. There were interventions of all uh, uh, parties government security agencies, our private com contractors, uh, our oil and gas companies, and very many others, there, including international stakeholders, to see how we can contain this situation. And oil theft is oil theft. You know, today, uh, when we started, around July last year, you know, we have thousands of insertions on our pipeline. We have seen, I'm sure you, you must have seen this in some of the media outings that we have we've met, where you have seen installations on our pipeline that could be as old as 10 years. That means it's a systemic age-old practice uh, that we probably didn't pay too much attention to. But the reality today is that we have seen the problem, we have seen the challenge, we have risen to this challenge as a country, and, and we have seen the outcome of those, uh, those interventions. But why would this happen in the first instance? You know, I think that's the key question that, that, that needs, to be, needs to be answered. You know? When you allow uh, your assets to become vulnerable, you know, over a period of time, because of a number of interventions that you couldn't do, a number of uh, social engagements that you're probably not able to do properly, and ultimately it builds up to this situation. And what we're doing now is to correct all this, increase the social engagement, participation of the communities, give them a stake in this, uh, uh, this intervention that we're doing, and to making sure that delivering uh, crude into the terminal serves everybody's interest. Uh, first of all, resources will be available, jobs will be created along the right of way of these pipelines, uh, communities will benefit from it, and ultimately the larger Nigerian uh, population will benefit from it. I think this is the, the, the way that it has worked, 
and and I'm sure that uh, we'll continue to improve on this so that ultimately we can recover our full production. Are people being held responsible for this theft? Today, I don't have the real numbers now, but uh, if I was interfered, I would have uh, come up with you. I know we have made hundreds of ar arrests now, and a number of people have been prosecuted. Institutions have been investigated today, and without, so that I don't become prejudicial to the uh, process, that I don't want to mention names, but I know that including high-profile people have been uh, in part of this, and they have been handled. Um, let's close this conversation and in this manner. The, the essence or the reason or the purpose of this conversation is about the groaning and the pains of the average Nigerian. Some of those who do not understand the technicalities of what these problems are. And it is unbelievable and some of them cannot even wrap their heads around how Nigeria that has huge deposit of this product under the soil will be suffering for the product just for them to move around. What promise can you make if you tell Nigerians, millions of them who are watching you tonight, that in the foreseeable future, this kind of problem will not be seen? And the fact that what's soothing and what of hope can you tell them this hour that will give them some kind of relief from the pains of the past few months? First of all, uh, I apologize for this situation. Uh, on behalf of all of us in the stakeholders in the oil and gas industry, uh, definitely uh, not surely exclusive. But having said, having said this, and it's unfortunate, uh, it's a glitch. We are responding to this glitch. We'll resolve this. I will bring a uh, circle and relief to Nigerian people. No doubt about it. No one orchestrated this. We have no benefit in doing this. Uh, we have families. We, have, uh, we are members of part of this community. We are very, very proud of this country. We will like this country to prosper. We will don't want Nigerians to suffer. And of course, it's a matter of conviction that we don't think that uh, anyone should go through this. Now, having said this, uh, you must have energy security in, in, your, in your country. That's what every country does. You know, in many countries, you find out that it's the armed forces who actually keep the strategic stuff for their countries. Because that's very critical, so that you don't run into situation the kind of situation that we are seeing today, even when it happens so that you're able to come out of it very, very quickly. By the way, you know, having fuel queues is really not uh, something that is uh, uh, local to any one country. It happens everywhere whenever you have other glitches of price, pipeline issues, and so on and so on. But not, we don't hope that this happens to our country. But you must have guarantee of supply in your country, which is why we're focused on delivering our refineries, rehabilitation projects, so that ultimately this product becomes close to us. The ref Dangote refineries come by the combination of this is that you will have product close to you. Now, this hasn't happened. The refineries rehabilitation is not completed. The Dangote refinery hasn't taken up. They will happen. Both of them will happen. Once that happens, you have the safety and security of supply near you. But in the absence of this, what do you do? Just like any other country who may not have those resources, is to import. And the guarantee I have now is that LMPC has locked supply into this country irrespective of the financing situation that we are, the challenges that we are facing. So we do not have delivery problem, we do not have supply problem, that we are sure that the requirement of 63 to 66, whatever volume, you know, up to 66 million, the LMPC has made plans, the vessels are arriving, they are in line of sight, and people can check this, they are not hidden. In fact, uh, we are actually considering publishing the name of the vessel that people can see, the, except for some security consideration. Otherwise, we have firm supply arrangement in the country. Now, the next thing you have to do is to deliver this product from this border vessel into fuel station. To that, you need marine vessels, you need depots, you need trucks, you need to engage stakeholders. You need to have support of government security agencies. You need to have support of go state governments. Are you getting that? Yes, I think I can. Are the independent marketers on board? We'd all, uh, and I'd like just to thank them that for they have given us all the cooperation that we require in the last two weeks. Uh, we have reached agreement and understanding with them. We are managing the prices jointly with them. They are making sure that trucks will be available. We are able to meet the requirements for this truck to move around. And we are also able to provide every other support that is required, including by government security agencies, to make sure that they deliver to this. I think, I think we have a start of relief. So one week, Nigerians will see a dramatic difference. There will be a difference, absolutely. When do you think that we can stop this importation? As soon as the Dangote refinery is comes up and we complete our refinery rehab project, you are done. Maybe what time? Maybe what month? The Dangote refinery year? is planned to come up latest by the half of this year. And some of our fuel plants will come out. I believe that this year, before the end of this year, we'll be net exporter of petroleum product as a country. Mr. Melekiari, 
Group uh, CEO of uh, Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited. Thank you so much indeed for your time tonight. Thank you, Okibaba. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it.